Welcome back to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey, and today we have Dr. Hector Salazar, one of our plastic surgeons. Welcome. Thank you so much, Monique. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's always great to have these conversations with you. As we've said on previous episodes, women have become more concerned about breast implant safety than cost in present, recent years. Breast implants are the safest medical device in history, but as we know, nothing is perfect. So, you know, we're going to talk today about what is a complication, is there a standard definition, and have Dr. Salazar really walk us through kind of what are maybe the top three common complications in surgery, of surgery in general, and then let's go into breast implant complications. So let's talk about surgery in general first. What, what do you mo most want to tell patients that could happen? Well, I, I would say that um, I, I would fully agree with you in, in your um, opening statement. Uh, first of all, with the fact that you say that patients are very concerned about like safety and the, the, we're seeing more and more educated patients. And uh, yeah, cost is probably not their main concern at this point, but uh, we want to share with them and explain to them all the risks and benefits and definitely foresee some of the complications. Now, the, the first and last idea about this podcast that I would actually share with uh, our audience is that uh, breast augmentation is a safe procedure, right? It, it, it even like, if you if you talk about uh, uh, going on the highway, I mean, it, it, that's risky as well, right? We never think about it that way, but, but breast augmentation is a safe procedure. It has his, its uh, potential risks. Um, and that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about. When, when to answer your question, uh, when we are uh, talking about any kind of surgery in general. So things that that they're always present are, are going to be, number one, there's, there can be some bleeding, right? To 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 reassure patients, we, we never leave the operating room when there's bleeding. We're, we're always there. We cauterize. We get everything under control. And sometimes bleeding can happen because of uh, changes in blood pressure. That's why we always ask patients not to exercise, not to not to win the lottery immediately after <laughs> surgery. You're going to get very, very excited and you can get into some bleeding. So nothing that accelerates your heart rate. Okay. Um, so 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 bleeding is a it's a, a potential complication. Mm -hmm. uh, very rare, though, but but it, it's it is a complication that potentially can be present. Uh, something else could be um, infection. Right. Okay. So anytime that you have a disruption in your skin, even like with a paper cut, you can you can get infected. Right. Mm -hmm. So if especially if you're doing like large incisions, everything, though, all this, the, the environment in the operating room is sterile. Everything's very clean. And uh, all of our instruments and uh, most uh, um, pr pretty much every all the culture that it's around the operating room, it's all about performing a clean surgery. So, but despite of that fact, one bacteria can be present actually most of the time on this patient of that, uh, on the patient's skin, actually living on the patient's skin. And because of that disruption of the skin, then that bacteria can jump in and start creating a, a party over there and, and, and create, <laughs> reproducing and getting an infection. How do we prevent all that? We prevent all that by giving them, giving patients antibiotics. Actually, when the patient goes to sleep, they don't see this, but then we push some antibiotics through the IV. And the other thing is we watch them very closely after surgery to make sure that if something is developing, oh, we can jump in on top and uh, start treating that, that infection. So infection is another very rare complication, but, but it, it exists. Um, uh, something else um, that that could could happen would be, um, let's say, a complication is a, a delay in wound healing, so that the incision that we make um, and, and breast augmentation probably it's it goes at a little bit lower. But when we make, for instance, an abdominoplasty, as you were asking me, in surgeries in general, when you make a very very long incision. The body that is not used to create more tissue anymore because we're not 13 or 12 years old, uh, the body has already reached a stable um, economy in which the only thing that your body is replacing is the usual, right? A little bit of hair, a little bit of the skin, a little bit of the mucosal lining um, inside of your mouth, et cetera, et cetera. So, so all of a sudden, the body has a long incision that has to heal. And sometimes this creates a disruption in the economy of the body, and then it can take a little bit more effort to heal a particular area of that uh, incision. 
So I would say those those three are are uh, one of the ones that I always bring the attention of my patients to in general, I would say. Uh-huh. And anesthesia-related complications, is that something that patients need to be concerned about? Let me explain to, to our, our audience the fact that, number one, you're having your surgery performed at the right place, right? So what do I mean by that? It's not in, a, in an office. It's, it's actually a surgical center. It's a surgical center that's certified by, it, it, when we call it, I mean, the way we explain that to patients, because this the certification is called Quad A certification, but the, honestly, that to the general population is not going to say a lot. But what that means is that our outpatient surgery center has the exact same certification that the surgery centers of Sharp, Scripps, uh, Kaiser, uh, outpatient surgery centers have. So that's for their reassurance, right? We keep up mm. that certification so they're having their surgery done at a real operating room. And that's important. The other thing is that the anesthesia is being provided by a board certified anesthesiologist. So a board certified anesthesiologist, we work with a very tight group of mainly three anesthesiologists that have been with us for a very, very long time. And they're extremely experienced. And in their previous life, when they were providing anesthesia at the hospital, they were doing a lot of even heart cases. So they're very well trained. They are, um, they're, they're the real deal. It's not that it's going to be uh, a doctor that's operating and at the same time giving anesthesia or trying to mm-hmm. control other things. The only thing that, um, that the plastic surgeon is going to be doing is going to be focusing in the cosmetic part of the procedure and the anesthesiologist is going to be watching them all the time that they're there. And we have two operating rooms in the cent- and, and, and those operating rooms are covered each by one anesthesiologist. It's not that there is an anesthesiologist going back and forth between the two rooms. And that's another important thing for our audience to make sure that when they're considering a center that they have that. Yeah, you have your own anesthesiologist for mm-hmm. that case. Exactly. And, yeah. And um, we actually have an episode or two, but for sure one, on anesthesia. And one of our anesthesiologists, actually Dr. Steve Saltz, Mm -hmm. Dr. Lori Saltz's husband, and he's been with our group for a really long time, the same as all the other um, anesthesiologists that we have. And it's really, really interesting. So if, if that's something that you're thinking about, like, a little worried about anesthesia or just want to know more about it, listen to that episode. I th- we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes so it's easier to find. Um, so now let's get into breast surgery. And mm-hmm. what are the most common breast surgery complications? Where I want to bring the spotlight when I talk to patients about uh, breast um, implant complications um, is number one, we can talk about capsular contracture. Number two, we can talk about implant failure or rupture. Mm-hmm. And, and number three, we can talk about um, uh, it, some sort of a need for a revision or a second surgery. It, well, most implants, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, go under the muscle, right? You're putting uh, them under the muscle. So the pain is, is the most of the pain related to that muscle stretching? Correct. Uh, um, normally under, under the muscle, you, there, there's nothing. Right. And then the muscle is going to be contracting, but now it's going to be contracting on top of something. So the way I like to uh, create an analogy for patients uh, is imagine that you have your keys in your back pocket and then you sit down and you feel those keys. But then five minutes, 10 minutes later, you, you don't remember about those keys. As a matter of fact, you might be looking where they are, where are they, where are those kids? And then the keys are in your back pocket because you stop actually being attentive or paying attention to the fact that they're there. Um, same thing with, you can talk about sunglasses right. or, a, or a cap, they're, right? They're on your head. <laughs> they're on your head. And where are, where, where's my cap? And I'm wearing it, right? So so uh, when, when the first moment the patients start feeling those implants behind the muscle, they're going to be, they're going to feel some good amount of pressure that's where the main discomfort of the surgery comes from. Um, then they're going to start getting more and more active. So then they're get, the muscles going to start contracting on top of the implant, and that generates some discomfort. And they realize that that exists. Little by little, their brain, the muscle is going to get used to the presence of the implant, and also little by little, they're going to start ignoring the fact that they have implants, and then they integrate very well into their lives. 
Um, another thing that also takes a little bit of time, and, and patients mention it um, uh, quite frequently, is that the nipples are a little bit or get a little bit more sensitive. Oh. That they they get even sometimes with clothing, and the reason for that is because there's you're pushing on the back of the nipples, and the nipple is the areola. The nipple areola complex has some muscle and a component into it, so that's the reason how it can contract. But now oh. you're stimulating it from the inside. Oh, you're, interesting. You're, and and that takes some time as well for for that um, for the nipple and areola to get used to it, and then you're like, oh, okay, we going back to normal. Uh, and now is that you're talking about extra pain or sensation, but is there also ever any numbness in that area? B- or... Very rarely. Okay. Uh, I would say okay. extreme. I can I can close my eyes, try to remember the last patient that mentioned something like that with a pure breast augmentation and changes in sensation either to to have um to lose some of that sensation or to become numb. Uh, it's going to be really, really rare. I mean, okay. I, I okay. wouldn't say that it even reaches uh, 0.5% uh, of change in sensation. Okay. Well, that's mm-hmm. good to know. Cause I, mm-hmm. you know, there's urban legends out there. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Oh, you know, well, this could happen and that could happen. And so it's like, well, we don't know. So this is, it's good to help, you know, help everybody understand, you know, yes. if it happens, it's like really, really, really rare. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you, you touched on capsular contracture. So mm-hmm. what is that what, and what causes it? And is there a way to prevent it? Okay. Um, so capsular contracture, patients also t- talk about it as encapsulation of the implants. That's also how they mention it. Or they can tell you that, oh, I saw my friend that got an implant that was like tight and higher mm-hmm. than the other one and kind of harder. Um, so what that, what, re, what, what capsular contracture is, you have... So the breast implant is a foreign body, right? Just like any other implant that we have in our body. What, what, could, what could that be? It could be um, a, 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 a hip replacement. It could be a, uh, a pacemaker. So it's a foreign body that's inside of your body. It's not part of your own tissue. Also think about it as a splinter or the tip of a pencil that was never removed or something that actually got into your body for a reason and um and what happens is that your defense cells actually are going to detect that as a as a foreign body as a foreign object so they'll going to start orchestrating our response for you to start creating a capsule around the implant and i'm not talking about the the actual shell of, of the of the implant we're talking about a capsule that your body is going to create. It doesn't mm-hmm. come, and this is very important. That cup capsule does not come from the from the implant. That's a capsule that your body starts depositing all the way around mm-hmm. that implant to, in a way, according to your body, protect you from that foreign object. Right, so you're protected. Um, I would say the great majority of patients, more or less the number is 90% of patients for the first 10 years, that capsule is going to remain soft, nice, pliable without a problem. Numbers vary, but anywhere from 8 to 10, 12% of patients are or have the risk during the first 10 years to develop capsular contracture. So what that is, Think about it this way. So the implant is covered by that capsule. So the implant's inside, but then your body, for some reason, in a silly way, decides to start shrinking that capsule and making the foreign object, squeezing it and making it as tiny as possible so it doesn't bother you or it doesn't hurt you. It's such a silly reaction. (laughs) I mean, no, please don't help me. Don't help me that way. If... (laughs) Right. If if you think about it, when when you think when you think about asthma, right? Asthma, you get a little bit of dust or a little bit of pollen or something in in your nostril, and then all of a sudden your bronchial tree shuts down and tries to defend you from that agent. And you're like, oh no, please, please don't help me that way. <laughs> um, we do not exactly know what triggers that response. Some uh, studies have said, well, maybe there's a little bit and a little bit of an infection that nobody. That, that, that the patient actually never realized that there was an infection. Other studies say, well, no, the, what it is is the presence of a little bit of blood 
If there is like a little bit of a microscopical bleeding there, then the capsule can start tightening. Or we have even actually see, we have seen patients that they go to the dentist, they get like a deep dental cleaning, and then sometimes they come back and, and they come with, with an encapsulation of the implant. And, wow. and it's like, right, it's like, it doesn't make, it, it doesn't make any sense, but, but it's a reality, it can happen. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time happens only on one side. So oh. also that makes us think like, oh, I mean, because it's nothing systemic that's happening in your body, right? Something may be localized to that breast. So um, it, it's not that the great majority of patients, of course, as I'm saying, that have breast augmentation will suffer from this, but th there's a minority of patients that can experience that in the first 10 years. So um, we have ways to, or we actually take, um, we actually take 14 steps in the operating room to prevent this 14 um, 14, 14 separate we, steps 14 separate <laughs> steps and okay. and we do we do we do them religiously and this has become part of our routine starting from the prep of of the patient uh, even switching gloves before you manipulate implants not touching the implant actually at all uh using uh using a a special funnel to put the implant in so that the implant never touches the patient's skin oh, um wow. Um, washing the the cavity with antibiotics and and reprepping again before the moment that we're gonna uh, put in the implant, but but several several things that we do in order for us to prevent it. And the more and more, um, the more and more we get studies uh, out uh, uh, in regards to capsular contracture, the more things we learn and see um, about it. For instance, now we know that um, having the implant behind the gland places that patient at a higher risk of developing capsular contracture. So placing the implant behind the muscle actually protects or gives you that protection of staying away from the gland. The gland has communication to the outside world, right? For, for the purposes mm -hmm. of the gland, of the through the ducts, the gland communicates to the outside world. So mm, the, I mean, we're thinking about maybe some bacteria that was jumping around the implant, so it's easier to happen in a place where you have contact with the, to the outside world through the ducts than if you have it behind the muscle. So, um, so that's actually what we do to to prevent um, that. Also, we have seen that if we go through the inframammary fold to the crease, if we place the implant through there, the rate of capsular contracture is lower than if we go through the areola. So that's that's another change another, of, or another, another change. thing. Yeah, because you know when I started thirty-one years ago, <laughs> nice. It was that everyone that the the implants were put on top of the muscle most right. of the time, thinking that's going to look the most natural. Not everyone, but mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, they're smooth and textured, and all over the years that you know, then the Keller funnel came in, and all these different things. It's kind of cool to know that mm -hmm. you know the, the technology and the um the way that everybody's doing the surgery has sort of everybody's worked together to reduce that that number of people to um to be as low as it can be mm -hmm. and and uh the treatment for it if a patient gets capsular contracture or develops capsular contracture is to go in remove the capsule so that we call a capsulectomy remove the capsule and we take the or the implant original implant we take it out we get rid of it because if we were thinking that maybe there was a little bit of contact with blood or maybe there's a contact with bacteria you know what let's get a fresh implant in and um and we put a fresh implant in and then we go ahead and close and immediately patients after immediately they notice a difference because the implant's not going to be riding high it's not going to be hard or encapsulated and uh and even that generates some tension internally that sometimes patients some patients can develop some pain but some patients actually just say like, oh, I don't know. It feels feels so much better. I feel so uh -huh. it's it, I'm, 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 it's not hard. Oh my god, this is much much better, much more natural, of course. So uh, so that's the treatment to do a capsulectomy and an implant exchange. And is that a pretty straightforward surgery for patients? I would say uh, pretty straightforward surgery. Is something that that it, it has been well established. The treatment. The only thing that you have to talk to patients about is if you're going to go in. You're going to be playing the game again, right? You're going to you you have the risk of do, or getting capsular contracture because you're going to be in at any time that you go in and you exchange implants. If it's for a different reason, or you're going to do a lift and you're going to change the implants, 
you're playing the game again of you're having hopping that, on the freeway. <laughs> eggs, you're hopping on the freeway, right? And 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 actually, um, uh, they're aware and they know that maybe because their bodies have already demonstrated that they have a little bit of a they have more predilection they can to to do this or develop these capsules uh, that are tight that they can have that again. But we see a good number of patients that actually never had it, never have it back again. Mm -hmm. If there's a recurrence, a second uh, encapsulation, then we have a, another treatment for them. And that's like to use, um, to use an ADM or to use a mesh to, to hide that mm -hmm. implant from your defense cells to hide that implant. And we can talk later about it, but that's, yeah. that, that's a complete, we could have like a complete podcast on this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So now what, and and this is we're going to have a, we're following one of the patients that you just recently did surgery on a week ago. Oh, fantastic! And so her name is Tati. She's on the radio, and so she's been talking on the radio about that. I'm not giving away any secrets. That that's but correct. She had had breast implants, I think, when she was maybe in her mid twenties, and mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. had a deflation recently, and mm -hmm. so she then came and saw you and. I think she just had her surgery a week ago. She was back on the radio, I heard yesterday. So mm -hmm. that was Wednesday. So, you know, five or six days later. Correct. So when somebody has an implant rupture or deflate, like how would they know? I think if it's saline, it would be really obvious, right? It's popped and it's like a deflated balloon. But what about maybe what causes that in a saline and then what in a silicone implant might be the giveaway that something's not right? We can all relate to a, a balloon that's filled up with water. And if it doesn't matter if you poke a very, very tiny hole in, in it, it's going to deflate completely sooner or later, right? I mean, so so if, um, if, if a patient has saline implants and the volume that they have is still present, they can rest assured that there's, that that implant is, has not, it's not ruptured because uh -huh. otherwise all the volume would have been already out little by little. And then like the course of one or two days or three days, actually that saline gets absorbed by the body, filtrated by the kidneys, and you go to the bathroom and get rid of that <laughs> volume. And uh, so the when you have a saline implant, the sign of deflation is, oh, look at this <laughs> breast. This is the way this other one here used to look like. And right now, I noticed this that discrepancy. Is that an emergency? Something you got to run to go and see your plastic surgeon or go to the ER? I would definitely wouldn't go to the ER for that. I would go ahead. It's not nothing that you have to rush, but probably to go and be assessed by a by a board certified plastic surgeon. Give us a call. Give the office a call. Set up an appointment for it within the next couple of weeks, and then we can um, make sure that everything looks okay, and we can plan for the surgery again nothing bad is going to happen with that deflated device because you you had it inside of your body you had to contain water but now or saline but but now it has been deflated and it's never a good thing to have a ruptured device inside of your body so you can yeah. schedule the surgery uh, as, as soon as possible but without you know like if you have a very important thing that you have to do tomorrow or the following week you can actually do that and then later come back and do it um in terms of the silicone gel implants, um, they're a, a deflation is it's a, it's harder to actually uh, detect. Um, there's could be like some uh, constant pain or some skin irritation or changes in the shape of the breast, um, or or actually uh, some contractures sometimes can uh, can can also be caused by a, a rupture in the implant, but it's not as obvious. So if if you're really concerned, the first step would be to go and um, visit with your plastic surgeon, then determine if it's a good idea to just observe it or if it's a good idea to go ahead and pursue an MRI or a high definition ultrasound to make sure that the implant is intact or not. So they can come to you, have you do that high definition ultrasound and, and can you nine times out of 10 see if there's a problem? Maybe is it pretty obvious? It, it, it's really for, for the... For the expert eye, it's pretty obvious. So, um, and we we like to share that with patients because that's because that, it's it's funny when you put out the ultrasound, everybody 
relates to, oh, like a baby, like the, <laughs> like you're, you're looking for a baby. And uh, so then we start explaining then, OK, so this is your skin. This over here is a little bit of fat, the breast gland. This is the muscle. This is where the implant is. This is the shell of the implant. That's what we are. We're looking for that integrity of that shell. And then we look for it together and uh, yeah. they they actually are, are seeing the screen and everything. So um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I would say in terms of. <sighs> One way to look at the implants is to to realize or to to acknowledge that that implants are man made objects, right? Mm -hmm. As in any man made object, they can fail. It's extremely rare for implants to rupture, especially, especially like to rupture spontaneously. It, it, I mean, it's it's and I mean, pa patients can actually see or some patients actually um, come in and they say that, oh, I've already watched, uh, videos on, on YouTube where they ran over, uh, uh with a truck on like a, an, <laughs> an implant. It doesn't, it doesn't get ruptured. And uh, because they, they're quite resistant. I, I, I tell patients that, uh, when probably at, at a, at a, our three month or six month office visit, we, we always go over like when to be concerned about right. what, what type of trauma uh, can yeah. actually rupture my implant, right? So maybe if you're riding in uh, like a, uh, you're, you're in your car, you're driving highway, God forbids, uh, motor vehicle accident, uh, 80, 75 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour, um, deployment of an airbag, you were wearing the seatbelt. So maybe at that point, it wouldn't be a bad idea to obtain an MRI, make sure that those implants are intact. Um, but someone that I was about to walk into a, a bathroom and someone opened the door and like hit me a little bit with that door or someone I was at a concert and they elbowed me on the breast as they were jumping. That's re really not not a concern for a rupture of an implant. Might be sore. But yeah, right, might, might be sore, but, it. <laughs> but that's it. It's, 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 we, we're not going to run for an MRI or, or a high yeah. definition ultrasound. Now, do you have any... Um stories or like, can you remember any scenarios that of, of some sort of event causing the rupture of any patients that you've had, or is it more just sort of, they break down over time and it could happen? Uh, I, I could tell you that I have, that, that we hear, that we hear all, all those, all those stories, meaning patients that never had any trauma that come in that they cannot identify any moment and uh, the implants have been there for 15 20 years and yeah they're they're ruptured uh -huh. or patients that come in and um some sometimes what happens is patients get an um get a mammogram and then they after the mammogram they are looking for a better characterize, better t like take a closer look at a uh, at a small lesion. And then they order an MRI. And then the MRI, the MRI is really good to catch on not only those small cancerous lesions, but it's very good at catching uh, implant ruptures. It's so good that sometimes over calls those ruptures. It's so, it's so, so sensitive that actually goes in and tells sometimes they say like oh it looks like a rupture and then the radiologist actually read his, reads the MRI and say like yep yeah, looks like a rupture you go in and maybe the implant had a little little tiny fold on its own it was folded and sometimes that can be called as a rupture oh, but oh i see but you get that that's also some, some of the uh, flavor that we even get right i mean some <laughs> MRI that says like oh the implant might be ruptured um most of the time that tends to happen um down the road, meaning okay. uh, if there is a rupture, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen. I can assure you in, in day one or year one or two or three it tends to happen a little bit later in time. Are the implants that we're using right now, the most modern implants, um, the, the shell of the implant, now we're not talking about the capsule that your body forms, but the shell of the implant tends to be much more resistant. So that's also reassuring. Um, the FDA recommendation of having them exchange every 10 years has not changed, but patients should be happier that they're getting a shell of a, of a breast implant that's much more resistant. Mm -hmm. So It's sort of like your phone, you know, if you have correct. one that's a few generations back, it doesn't mean it's not working, but mm -hmm. <laughs> the new but, one, you're going to, you know, if, if you end up after 10 years or 15 years switching out, you're getting like the newest technology, right? Correct. I'm sure there's been improvements 
every time there's a new generation of implants that comes out. Absolutely. So now you just made me think as a woman, Mm -hmm. having had many mammograms in my life, I don't happen to have implants, but those things hurt those mammograms. Now, could a mammogram ever cause a rupture? Because they really smush you. (laughs) They, they they really smooshed but we can go back to the a YouTube video of the truck. Okay. No. <laughs> but, but yeah, there, there's no no um, evidence based uh, doc uh, papers studies that we can okay. quote that it said so, like getting can, mammograms. So it's safe because you, you want to get your mammogram no matter right. what. So this exactly. is that's more important than the. But you just uh, just to, so we all are feel assured that um, that's not going to be that. something. <laughs> Correct, correct. And now we talked at the very beginning in about complications that can happen with any surgery. And the one that comes to my mind is a hematoma, which is when you have mm-hmm. that bleeding happen. And mm-hmm. sometimes it wouldn't necessarily, it could happen right out of the OR, but based on your 14 steps, it sounds like that's a pretty unusual circumstance. But if people, you know, we tell don't lift luggage. Don't, if you're going on a trip, have somebody do it for you. Don't put, you know, don't do crazy things with the weight machine because you just had implants. Because I think from what I understand is that's how you can end up having that complication is then, then you can get bleeding, right? And then it, the one breast might get bigger. Um, what I tell, what I tell my patients is um, that for three weeks, in reality, I, I wouldn't like them to be exercising at all and wouldn't like them to be carrying heavy things. Uh, and when I talk about heavy things, I, I make it, I, I mean, I bring it down to think about a gallon of milk. So you can carry a gallon of milk, you can pour milk on your coffee, but but that's it. No, no, no heavier than a gallon of milk. I would tell you that in 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 my practice, it's extremely, extremely uncommon that I have post-operative bleedings, but because I tell the patients once, twice, three times, four times, do not become creative. The problem is, the problem is patients, and again, and this is for patients to take note of their recovery. So they're going to feel fine probably after two to three days. There's some patients that walk in day one, then it looks like we never operated on them and they feel fine. We are happy for them but we start getting a little nervous because because we say, oh, they're going to try to do too much. So again, tell them the story again, have the conversation. Classic thing is you're correctly saying they, uh, one week after they were feeling fine, they decide to go to um, Whole Foods, get some groceries. There was a bag that was heavier than the other ones. And when they were putting it in the trunk, oh, I felt like a pop doc. And then it started getting bigger. So we don't want that. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's a matter of t- assessing the patient, making the decision, taking the patient back to the operating room. They have to undergo anesthesia again. Again, mm-hmm. we're in a very safe environment. Um, and they go to sleep, make that small incision that we had originally, take the implant out, we'll take a look, take the blood out, take a look in there, find the bleeder, Again, cauterize it and then clean everything and get that implant back in again. And we close up that incision. Um, but we don't want to do that. Right. We, we there, There's no need. So <laughs> so just take it easy. Take binge, it easy. On, <laughs> binge on Netflix for those three weeks. Catch up on some good series that, that were pending um, and read some good books. Uh, chat with friends. Uh, but don't don't do a lot. Listen to our podcast, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Finish them all. What else is better? Um, so now who pays the bill when something like that happens? Is there like complication insurance or what? You know, if if the patient's putting groceries in her car or exercising, you told her not to, like, there's going to be some costs involved, I would think. Right. It, it 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 depends on the situation. It depends on the timing. And um, we always work uh, with our patients. Um, but it depends on timing of things. It depends on the circumstances. So we would be assessing um, uh, pretty much everything on a case-by-case basis. And I, I know patients are very, they get very, very close with their coordinators. But for certain complications, and let me share this with you, for certain complications, for instance, like um, an implant rupture or sometimes capsular contracture, um, the implants that we uh, use, they come with, with, a insurance 
that protects them from that rupture. In what sense? The sense of if the air implant ruptures, then the implant company would actually exchange that implant for them. So it said like, okay, so they're going to remove the implant that's ruptured. Here's, here is your free implant back. So they don't uh -huh. have to pay for the implant. And that's really good. And it depends on the plans, but they have like a little, um, some economical aid for patients because here's the deal. We have to go back to the operating room. Mm -hmm. We have to go, we patient have to go under anesthesia. There are going to be resources that need to be used. They're going to be mm -hmm. to, yeah. I mean, it, 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 anything starting from sutures or instruments for um, devices or like anesthesia gas. I mean, right. every, every single thing. So uh, if it's a force, someone's forcing us, some situation is forcing us to go back to the operating room, there's going to be some cost. But um, of course, uh, if it, it depends on timing, and it depends on, on situations, but I would say that um, that uh, we, we always work with our patients to, to make their experience their, their best. Now, in general, I guess, and I don't even know if it's if this is a question you can answer. Like, how common are complications? Can you say one in three thousand people, or one in two hundred fifty people, or I mean, is there kind of any way to for patients to think about it, or that, or do you have a good analogy for how small of a risk the, the, the surgery is? Yeah, no, I mean, and and you can talk about different um, different rate or different things, right? We, we, mm -hmm. We've been talking about like very different types of complications. If you want to individualize, like if you can say uh, how many, how common is that a patient bleeds? Well, then at that point, you're probably going to be talking around anywhere from 0.5 to 1 to 1.5 percent. If you're talking about infection, maybe it's around 1 percent of the time. Some, some like very, very light infection that can get treated with antibiotics. So, so the, all these complications are very, very uncommon. If you, if you, most of our patients come in and out and leave um, the operating room, and we also follow them really closely. We see them the next day after. So we tell them, do not worry about taking a shower. Don't worry about changing your dressings. We will do that for you the following day. And really, and really, the next day. The only reason why we're seeing them is to make sure that there's no problem. We're not seeing them for symmetry. We're not seeing to yeah. how beautiful the <laughs> side of the breast is going to start looking. The only reason why we see them is to make sure that there is no complication, that there's no bleeding, make sure that the incision is ready to start healing in the right way. We see them back at about a week. Mm. Same thing. We're not seeing them to assess if the volume is, matches perfect. It, with the only reason why we're seeing them is to make sure that there's no infection, that there's no bleeding, that there's no collection of fluid accumulating. Yeah. So, so we, I think the most important part for all of our uh, patients to have in mind is that they will be watched very, very closely by our team and that we are there to intervene. It's not that we operate and some patients actually, when they see that we, that, that we see them the day after surgery in a week, and then we tell them we're going to be, you're going to come back in three weeks and you're going to come in six weeks and, or, and, or sooner if you need it, they get surprised. And it's like, oh my God, I thought that was going to be my, my last visit. I, I thought like <laughs> day one is like, oh yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's something that we, that we do. And I would say that that's a, that's something across the board that we do at La Jolla Cosmetic to follow our patients very closely to see if there's a need for any intervention that we need to do. And let's say, even though this isn't a complication per se, but say, you know, you're talking about symmetry. Mm -hmm. How long should a patient, you know, things like, like you say, people swell more on one side or, you know, your body is just weird a lot of the times, however your body decides to deal with something. So mm -hmm. how long, if somebody's thinking, oh gosh, you know, this side's slightly different than that side or higher or lower, when do you kind of want them to wait for things to settle down? Like at what point is it? Three months, six months, a year. The first set of pictures, we start taking them about six weeks. Okay. And that's, and, and we never say, I mean, congratulations, here's your, here are your <laughs> set of pictures, fantastic before and after. The reason why we take pictures at about six weeks, it's because the swelling pretty much is starting to resolve. So the swelling is gone. Still, we're working with tissue that is, is alive. It's tissue that it's going to move. It's going to adjust. It's it's the way. I mean, I've told some patients that when I when I when I got this this uh, 
orange jacket. Um, Which they is never fabulous, by the uh, way. I they, love it. <laughs> when when I when I got it, they never told me, oh, Dr. Salazar, wait for a couple of weeks and you'll see how it's going to start cinching better around the waist and your arms are going <laughs> to, right? But it, because it's completely inanimate tissue, it's it is what it is. So that's what you're purchasing. That's what you're getting. With surgery, we work with living tissue. So tissue is going to swell up. Tissue is going to retract. The implants, we live on planet Earth. There's going to be some gravity. They need to settle. They need to go to their final position. We estimate all these different things. So at about, I mean, literally for the first three, four weeks to to start paying attention to things, you you are assessing a moving target. About six weeks, we start, like we get a nice setup uh, for uh, pictures, establish a baseline, then at about three months, we're going to have a very, very good idea about where the implants are sitting for, for good, what's going to be their final position. The swelling is going to be pretty much done uh, around that time. Then you move into those six months, as, you, as you're saying, and that gives you a great, great idea of the, of the symmetry of the final result. One of the things I would say, the only thing we do throughout the week is actually we measure breast all the time, every day. We start measuring and looking. <laughs> and one thing that we see is that to find that woman that has the perfect measurements of their breast, it, it actually, it, it, it never happen. happens. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't exist. happen. It doesn't <laughs> exist. It always tends to happen. There's one, I mean, you, you can, you look at the face, right? One side of the face is a little smaller. The other side of the face is a little bit larger. Same thing happens with with breast and and um and and one's breast tends to sit a little higher and the one that sits a little higher is, tends to be a little bit smaller but all within normal anatomical differences there are cases in which you have a severe a severe asymmetry and we can entertain the idea of ways that we can start compensating for that but sometimes when you have a minimal difference it's really, really not noticeable if you are not measuring it uh-huh. the way we do very strictly measure the breast. So, um, and then we, we, we said about six months and then at about a year, we always want to see our patients specially. We, we, well, we review the FDA recommendations. We, we remind them about certain things that they have to do to, to the uh, implants and, and to establish a good, nice follow-up with them. Uh, every year, we like to see them. But also because at a year, the scar most likely of that small incision, four centimeter incision, well, well hidden, very inconspicuous, but we want to make sure that we like it, that it ha- actually has healed the right way. And uh-huh. that after that is going to continue healing and fading little by little up to a point that sometimes it's hard to find them. They're always going to be there, mm-hmm. but we want to make sure that we all like them. Uh-huh. We are satisfied with that incision, and if not, then we can go ahead and do a quick revision, or a little injection of something, or some some act take take action. But okay. I would say that that's our our routine follow up. Well, and that's really helpful. And I think when when you have your consultation with Dr. Salazar, he'll show pictures, and we have them on our website as well. Sort of that graduation. Here's at a couple mm-hmm. weeks. Here's at three weeks. Here's six months. Here's a year. Cause then you can kind of see, okay, if, cause I feel like as a patient, if we know what to expect, exactly. it's a lot easier to go through it. Right. If, if we go like, okay, this is what happened with this lady and I can relax and not mm-hmm. be worrying about every little detail because it's just going to take time. And, Beca- you know, and- in our very immediate society, we want it all happening in perfect immediately. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I purchased my iPhone and I wanted to be charged ready and ready to go. Even if yeah, I just yeah. opened it and unpacked it, I wanted yeah. to be able to use it the entire day. And that's actually the culture that we're leaving in. But again, we have to set the tone and tell, explain to our patients, it takes time. It's part of a process. Yeah. You know, we've been talking about complications all day, but what if something happens, like what position do you want to be in or what, what, what advice would you give to a patient? So, so I would say, like, re- remember when you we, we go through this um, consent, educated consent form decision, and and all patients will go in and and have this document that we are reviewing, and we it's based pretty much on what we discuss with them during the consultation. But you'll see all the different complications that could could happen, right? I mean, the reason why they're there is because they have been described. It most likely nothing bad is going to happen, right? right. But but what I tell patients is once they're um, doing their research in terms of who to have the surgery with is I want to 
bring to their attention that if a complication happens, go and have the surgery done with that plastic surgeon that you really and truly feel close to. Someone that will be there with you to deal with the complication. Someone that you can trust, someone that you say, okay, so he knows about these complications. He can take care of them. I feel fine. I can bring it. I can bring this issue up to him, to her, and they're going to be responsible. They're going to be responding. They're going to be, they're going to work with me to resolve all this. And I feel that that's what they're going to find in all of our surgeons at La Jolla Cosmetic, people that actually work hand by hand with the patient and actually people that are knowledgeable, have the experience and, 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 and the heart to actually sit next to the patient, not across the table where the patient's sitting. So we have this complication let's get going, let's start treating it. We're gonna give you this, we're gonna give you that. These are the different scenarios that we're gonna be facing. Mm -hmm. Let's see you tomorrow. Let's see you the following day. I would normally see you in a week, but you know what? Let me watch you cl even closer. I wanna uh -huh. make sure that we are that, that we are heading the right in the right direction. So yeah. that's something that, that yeah, is important. Yeah, so it's not just about really picking the plastic surgeon for your surgery, but thinking in the rare event something goes wrong, do I trust them to help me through it? Do I trust them to be my partner? In and, good, good times and in bad, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and and I think and we I'll put you, um a a you put it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, good, yeah. I'll put it um in the show notes because we do have a blog post about medical tourism. And that's the that's the thing. And I think you and I have talked about that mm -hmm. before, where you know save a little money. I'm going over here and getting my surgery. What if something goes wrong? <laughs> Where mm -hmm. is that person? Are you going to fly back to Turkey? <laughs> or right. are you, you know, right. are you, what, like, you have to think about those things. So we'll put, mm -hmm. we'll put a link to that blog post. And I think one of our, one of our, you and I, when we had a, um, our breast dog podcast, I think we talked mm -hmm. about, about that. So I'll let everybody know that. Well, thank you so much for all this great education today. I was oh, so, I'm so you know, happy. I think, I think, like I said, if, you know, if we kind of know what to expect and we know, you know, we, and we can kind of hit some of these complication topics head on, I think that's really helpful for patients be, to know that, you know, here's, here are some of the things that can happen. Here's how often we might see it almost never, but if it happens, here's how we fix it. And so I really appreciate your time today. And for everybody in the audience, if you're listening and we want to ask you a special favor, if you love our podcast, if you learn something from it, you know, write us a review. We would love it. And, you know, if you have any ideas on other topics you would like to hear from us and what, you know, our providers in our med spa and our, any of our plastic surgeons, please let us know. And we'll have everything in the show notes in terms of links about scheduling, our financing, reviews, photos, before and after photos, all of that great stuff will be in the show notes. So thanks everybody for today. See you again next time. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetic. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego Freeway in the Zymed building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.